but I'm Joseph Ruscio. I'm co-founder CTO of a company called Labrado. Uh, we do monitoring, and I personally love graphs. Uh, and the title of the talk, uh, it's not in production unless it's monitored, is, um, is one of my favorite quotes. And so I thought I would actually dig and, and try and find out where it came from. And as best I can tell, um, uh, Greg, uh, I'm not even going to pretend to mangle his last name. Uh, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but he's a, a DevOps engineer, an infrastructure engineer, if you'll have it, at uh, Evite. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, I think, that he said this, because Evite is one of the old Web 1.0 properties, right? So it was launched in 1998. Uh, they've sent something to the tune of a, over a billion uh, invitations. And about the time he, he put this up on Twitter, like a year and a half ago, um, they had just finished completely overhauling their system. So moving from Java and Oracle Rack over to things like Python, uh, Google App Engine, uh, various polyglot NoSQL solutions. And so it kind of made me start thinking about, so what, what about the context of that switch as they were preparing for the next decade made him say this? And so if you, if you think about kind of how uh, SaaS was developed like you know, 10 years ago, 14 years ago, you know, you'd start, uh, you'd get funded your quote unquote seed round, you know, it's the, the tune of millions of dollars. And that was because to just even get going, right, you had a big upfront capital expense, buy a lot of servers, physical rack and stack. You have a dedicated ops team, right, <clears throat> who uh, put those all together and finally write you your own custom software stack, right? Um, you know, Google, the Yahoo's, where everything's in house and everything runs on their own custom hardware. So now in, in uh, 2012, right, we have your seed round. If you're, not, if you're doing a seed round now, bootstrap, you know, to tune $20,000, your infrastructure is a monthly expense, just like your cable bill, right? You're using Amazon or Rackspace or whatever. Um, if you have an ops person, if you're lucky, it's one. Might even just be you. And finally, you're using uh, open source software and external services to build your, your whole stack. So what this means is that our infrastructure now, what's interesting if you look at the two of those, our infrastructure now is what I like to think of as agile. And, I, and, and definitely in the sense of agile of that moving quickly, adapting to change, it's ephemeral. Servers, instances come and go. You actually, uh, you know, when you talk with Amazon, they'll tell you literally, you know, you have to use multiple availability zones because we reserve the right to take your servers away at any time. <clears throat> so we're now in an environment where we have more change, but we actually have worse tools, right? So Google has amazing tools for monitoring and understanding what's happening inside of Google, but that doesn't do you any good. And <clears throat> if you look so we're, we're now, because of this, we're kind of seeing a renaissance in monitoring, I, I like to think of. And if you look at companies uh, you think of who are leading this, like the Etsy's, uh, Flickr, or even GitHub, and I was trying to find a common thread of you know, what, what were driving these guys to be so heavy into monitoring were uh, other people at the other end of the scale. And the one kind of common thread I came up with was continuous deployment. Right? Um, just how many people here do continuous deployment? Right? OK, so that's, that's about half. That's good. Uh, I, I mean, a quick digression on that. One of, the, one of the fascinating things I found about continuous deployment is it's, it's easy to see the case where you say, oh, yeah, we, we ship all the time. So we don't have this, oh, this three month, the huge release where there's all these features we ended up building that we didn't have to build and we wasted all this time. But a lot of times you'll get these. Uh, you know, someone come in and say, oh, okay, well, it'll be fine. We'll just schedule a release every week, right? Uh, which is, sounds great at first, but is, a, is kind of a false economy because <clears throat> if you ship once a week or once every two weeks, <clears throat> that means every week or every two weeks, you have a day where everyone's scrambling to do the big ship, right? They either are trying to get code in, in in time to make the ship or they're trying to figure out why something's not working and the ship is being delayed. And so anything other than continuous deployment is really a trade-off between a scheduled waste of time versus wasting time on features uh, that you may not have needed. So we, we do continuous deployment. And there's kind of, I, I like to think of uh, five steps to that. So the first is continuous integration, right? 
So as developers, you run tests all the time, so you have the confidence, hey, I'm pushing new code out, but I know it didn't break anything. Uh, there are no regressions. I'm going to make deploying as cheap as possible. So one click, whether it's a campfire bot or a single button, um, you know, make, make deploys as costless as possible. <clears throat> Once everything is out, you've deployed, use feature flagging as an additional installation where you can kind of uh, bleed users on, your own users personally, and then uh, a select percentage of your users until everyone gets it. Um, so this right here is a great setup already. But the problem is even this, you know, this is not enough. Bugs still make it through. And that's where monitoring comes in. And I think it's instructive. It, so continuous integration came out of agile test-driven development, right? We have these tests. We're going to run them all the time to reap the benefit. And if there's one takeaway, you, you should really start to think about monitoring and instrumentation is to operations as unit tests is to development, right? If we have good monitoring in place, then our ops people will sleep better because they know I'll be able to tell instantaneously uh, once this hits production that I don't have regressions. I can look at my dashboards and I can see there were no regressions. And the final component, uh, so that's active monitoring if you're actually visualizing or you're checking right after the deploy, but there are latent bugs is have good alerting. And alerting is definitely a component of monitoring. So if something does happen six or seven hours after a deploy, uh, you find out. Uh, as an example, here's a, um, a slide. Yeah, it's kind of dark. But uh, Travis CI, which is a great continuous integration project, um, did a post recently on monitoring. And this kind of illustrates the cycle that you go through. Uh, where you start and you see a deploy and there's a, they're tracking the number of error responses they get. So there's an immediate spike after the deploy, at which point I imagine they were scurrying around their keyboards trying to figure out what's going on, and they deployed a fix, and you can see that come back down. But there's still some noise, uh, you know, there's a, a green line noise. So they kept digging in, and you can see where they fixed another one. And at every stage, they had this immediate feedback on their progress in production. So that's, that's a good illustration. I think that's a good driver. If that's not enough, I'm not sure how many hardcore Rubyists there are in here, but you can also find the chunky bacon using monitoring. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is actually a, a graph from the wild, too. I didn't, I'd like to say I came up with some algorithm to draw that, but that actually happened. <clears throat> so now that you know monitoring leads to bacon, so that's our first. If you didn't get anything else, just think of it that way. Monitoring means bacon. Uh, you go to Google and you say, hey, I want to do monitoring. Let me, uh, let me do monitoring tools. And you get hit with this. Just an explosion, right, of all these different services, tools you can use. Um, some of these, oh, it's interesting, I put a mix up here. Uh, some of these I personally think are really, really good. Some of these I think are not so really good. But my hope is that at the end of the talk, I'll leave as an exercise to the audience to be able to discern that uh, for yourself. Now, if you do pick some of the not so really good ones, you're going to end up with something that looks like this. You'll come in and you say, OK, well, I need to monitor this. And I did pick those names. That's, not necess that's a hint, maybe. Uh, you'll end up with a system where you say, OK, I want to monitor this one thing or alert on this one thing. I'll pull this off the shelf. It's got some agent, it's got a storage, it's got a UI that you have to configure, and you're all set until you find something that doesn't do. So then you go Google and you find another one that does that, you pull that off the shelf, and pretty soon you've got multiple vertically integrated silos, you can't correlate across them, and you have to learn how to use each of them. And at this point, you reach this stage, <clears throat> where you say, you know what, monitoring sucks. This is really hard. There's these huge tools with uh, verbose configuration, configuration as code. The, uh, they're designed for extremely long-lived host, physical hosts. Uh, they try to be a jack of all trades. They don't do anything well. And you invariably need more than one of them. And, and this is something else if you're interested in this stuff. Monitoring sucks. This is a Twitter hashtag. Uh, there's an IRC room. There's even a GitHub repository. And it's a whole movement of uh, DevOps sysadmins trying to make monitoring better. So we need a better model, and, and that's really kind of gets to the core of the talk, because I want to kind of build a model 
that you should think about when you're evaluating monitoring tools or building your monitoring solution and things you should strive for. So first thing, consider our different metrics types we have. So you're going to be tracking your business drivers. This is probably a small number of things, but it's very important. It's the things that make you money. It's the things that keep you employed. So what are the numbers that if they go up or, or down, depending, uh, improve your business? <clears throat> You're going to have your application performance. So generally speaking, uh, you know, this is how well your requests, how, how well does your app feel to your customers. That's going to be tied. There's going to be system resources that are used by the application. Are there memory leaks? Is that what's causing our application to slow down? Is a disk full? And then there's network, uh, generally how I like to think, uh, how many connection attempts are we receiving? What's the load balancer doing? And what's interesting is you often, you're going to want the ability to cut across all levels of the stack, right? If the, uh, our business, for example, is driven by, you can think of it as the number of API calls we can, uh, we can handle. You know, we're a volume-based business. So we track very closely the number of API calls we're doing every second. And that has to do with, is impacted by how many our application can handle, what type of system resources, and, and the network. <clears throat> so if we're going to use one of those monolithic things, so look inside. So what does one of those monolithic things actually look like inside? Generally speaking, there's a collection stage, right? So this, this happens every request in your app. You have, something happens, you measure it, now you have a measurement. Uh, and this happens, you know, order 50, 100, 300 milliseconds, or if you have one of Ilya's web pages, every 15 seconds, um, you get a lot of these. So for trending, this information is way too dense, both both for just visualizing as well as storing. So there's an aggregation phase where we roll up uh, all these sub-second uh, measurements into uh, maybe 10-second interval or 15-second interval. Then we have to get this to disk somehow. Uh, we have to store this somewhere. And then we have different types of analyses, whether it's just plain visualization or alerting or even some type of algorithmic mining. <clears throat> so as, as people who maintain and operate software platforms, this kind of diagram should start screaming out at us if we're thinking about monolithic solutions, right? And this is a, a prime example of, of where we can use separations of concerns, right? We can split these behaviors out, and we can use well-defined interfaces between them so we can mix and match what we want to do. So digging into some of those, the most important one, or this is the most important place to focus on probably is collection. Because if we're going to use monitoring uh, for our operations like we use tests for our development, then the cost of collection has to be as close to zero as possible. When monitoring sucks, nobody does it because it sucks and there's a lot of friction. So we need to make it super easy. You know, new code goes out, it should have instrumentation with it when it goes out just like it has tests and we have to make that cheap. The cheapest way to, to monitor something you already have is logging, right? Uh, and there are some cool projects uh, you can use. Uh, Etsy Logster is one of them. If you think about logs as streams, right? I mean, so log files are interesting semi-structured text, you got a big log file, and you can throw all kinds of weird queries at it, which is, is nice. But as it streams to that file, it's, it, it's good to think of there are things in there. I can count the number of requests I had in one minute of that stream. Or I can count the number of 200s, the number of 500s. So there are several projects that will actually, as your logs are being consumed, uh, count things in them and generate statistics off them, which you can then graph, uh, alert, do all kinds of interesting things. Etsy Logster's one. Uh, Logstash, uh, these are all GitHub. Anywhere I have something slash something is a GitHub URL. <clears throat> Logs, so Etsy just looks, parses your existing log files. Logstash actually mimics uh, syslogd and has storage engine with it. And then there's finally, uh, there are a lot of good services too. We love Paper Trail. Uh, that also looks like syslogd um, and has integration with uh, you know, third party services like ours for, for graphing. In Rails specifically, uh, active support notifications. Um, one of my colleagues gave a talk yesterday on this. You should definitely check the slides out. Um, but basically, it's a pub sub instrumentation for Rails 3, uh, which makes it really cheap. First of all, there's a ton of out of the box instrumentation. And then it's really cheap to add new instrumentation to your Rails apps. And you can, uh, you can pipe that stuff, publish it to multiple places. 
A couple cool projects, Matthias Meyer's LogRage uses this to trim your Rails logs, which will go well with anything in the previous slide. Um, and then uh, Harness is a neat thing to hook in and then actually, instead of just going to logs, publish these to any third-party service. Another interesting collector for any Ruby project, although you can pull access support out too, but um, is metrics. And this is a project that just gives you simple primitives like counters, meters, timers, and makes it real easy to plug it into multiple reporting backends. I think he has Graphite, uh, he has Librato support, he has Riemann support. So now that you're collecting, uh, we've made it real cheap to collect. Uh, some of those collectors, metrics, actually the ones just on the last slide, actually does aggregation. So there are some collectors. But if you're writing something custom, um, or if you're using one that doesn't, you don't want to worry about that. And so there are, are tools you can use. The most well-known one uh, is StatsD. That comes out of Etsy as well. They've, they've done a lot of good stuff with monitoring. StatsD is, is really interesting. It's about 319 lines of Node.js. Just a little daemon. Um, it supports uh, several different types, counters, timers, gaugers. But what's neat is it just sits on a port and listens for UDP packets which means anything you're instrumenting, you have a zero cost, almost zero cost, to, in the middle of your request response cycle, dump a UDP packet. It's just the memory copy to a kernel buffer, right? Um, and the way we have this set up, the way I like to think about it, you can set one of these stats D daemons up somewhere in your network and have point all your servers at it. Uh, but given that it's like so small and so lightweight, we prefer to think of it as just something almost like a syslog D, right, where I just install, it runs on every one of, this is an example, one of our front end in interfaces, and it just sits there. So if I bring any new service on this box, I know I have StatsD locally. I don't have a single point of failure for aggregation in my network. And because the UDP is going over the loopback, uh, I mean, trending data, if you lose some measurements, it's not a big deal. I'm kind of pedantic. So I like knowing that it goes over the loop back and I have almost zero loss as long as the box is, is healthy. And besides the UDP being zero cost, what's really neat about StatsD is it's actually just defined a UDP wire protocol. That's the most important thing it did. So there are a ton of clients for that. Uh, Nginx module we use. Uh, GitHub put out a rack StatsD so you can get all types of rack level statistics into it. Shopify has this StatsD instrument, which lets you use in your application level and, and basically wrap code blocks and, and stuff and get things directly into StatsD. And what's nice about doing at multiple levels the same kind of stats is that when you're trying to debug a network issue and find out where in your stack it's coming from, you can compare these different ones. <clears throat> and because, like I said, it's just a UDP wire protocol, if you don't want to run Node.js, that's fine. It's only 319 lines. This guy, uh, it's joemiller.me. Uh, on his blog, he maintains a comprehensive list, at, at least as of recently it was updated, of all these different StatsD server implementations in Perl, Ruby, I think there's one in Go. So whatever language you're comfortable doing, uh, your production, managing in production, you can probably find an implementation of that. So now that we've, we've got collection, and aggregation is very cheap, low friction. Uh, the most important thing is how do you collect all this data in a central location where you can access it and do any, you know, your arbitrary correlations. And this is where, it, I, I do think you want to think carefully here because, you know, collection and, and aggregation is, is streaming, so it's very easy to swap things in and out. Um, with open interfaces and having storage being its own component, that isn't as hard to swap in and out, but there is some persistence there. So the first uh, RRD tool uh, is the round robin database tool. And this is the default. I, I think it's like 10 or 12 years old. Uh, but all, most of these monolithic solutions actually use this internally, so Cacti, Munin. And what's nice about this, if you're, if you're not aware of it, uh, it uses a circular buffer file to give you a constant guarantee on storage. So it, it writes uh, new values into the buffer. And if, you, if you've buffered enough space for 100 measurements, then the 101th measurement will overwrite the first one. And it's designed for roll-up. So you actually get multiple circular buffers uh, per metric. So you can have resolution. You can configure this. Um, but you can do resolution of you know, raw data, 10 second, and one minute roll-ups, 15 minute roll-ups. 
So that was one of the first ones. Uh, I think probably what's more interesting is these next couple solutions. So Graphite uh, is also based around Whisper RD, but it bundles a visualization component with it. And it's a separate visualization component, but it, it makes a lot of sense to bundle those uh, next to your storage, right? Because the visualization, a big piece of that is just pulling the data, how do you retrieving that out of storage and, and graphing it. So Graphite uses Whisper. This came out of Orbitz in 2008, orbits.com. A uh, couple things to know, it's got a flat hierarchical namespace, which means it stores just key values. But you, use, you can use your keys with dotted decimal notation to, to add dimensions in the name as long as it's a proper hierarchy. <clears throat> and it supports, to pull graphs out, uh, PNGs, uh, HTTP queries. A Couple things to consider here. Uh, this does seem to be kind of the intro tool a lot of people use, and it's, it's nice for that. Uh, but you do want to be careful to plan your capacity. This is generally used as a scale-up solution. Uh, it pre-allocates files for your metrics. So the, I usually end up seeing, based on retention settings, people using about 3.2 megabytes per file. And if you end up with a lot of metrics, I have seen in production people running uh, Graphite on a 64 gigabyte RAM FS. I've seen people with 10 SSD drives together in a RAID 0. Big hardware solutions to scale up to that. So if you think you're going to have that much data, one solution that's pretty neat came out of StumbleUpon is uh, the Open Time Series database. And that's based off of uh, HBase, Hadoop. And so what's neat about that, horizontally scalable Hadoop, lots of storage. Uh, it supports, because of that, multiple dimensions. So it uses denormalization. If you want to tag a particular measurement with multiple, uh, I want to look this up on this dimension and this dimension, so I want to look this up on the host name as well as the time zone um, by writing the, me the measurement multiple times and HTTP queries. Um, and the only downside here is you have to run a, a Hadoop query. <clears throat> uh, your last uh, you know, option is to use a service. Uh, we provide one. Uh, there are several others you can look if you Google around. Uh, typically, I think the best way to do this, what we do, is, is JSON over HTTP. You, you just push to an API measurements. Uh, there are additionally, typically, agents and, and language bindings to make that easy. Uh, they generally have roll-ups. Uh, and we have interactive front ends, typically services like ours. Visualization, like, there's a couple things to think about visualization. Most, one of the most important is uh, correlation. So you want the ability, and, and part of driving towards this common infrastructure, if, you, if collection's really cheap, and all these different collectors, you can come up with new collectors and get things into a central repository of Graphite Open Time Series database. At this point, whenever you're trying to diagnose something, you have all the data in one place, you can build any graph you want, right? And in addition to putting metrics on that graph, ideally you're gonna have a solution uh, you know, one of the things we're working on and these existing solutions have is annotations. So an important thing to also think about uh, events like deploys as something you should be monitoring, right? You should be, having, you should be pushing a stream, uh, ideally with context, so the, sh the SHA of the deploy. So when you're doing a correlation, you can overlay your deploys or overlay um, network events or whatever other events you're tracking with there. And you want these uh, arbitrary combinations. A couple examples, this is a open time series database correlation. It's, uh, you, it's hard to read the legend. This came right off their front page, though. It's, I think it's MySQL delete queries with um, 99th percentile performance. <clears throat> this, is one of, this is a correlation I took out of our system for our storage ring. And so it's correlating uh, read requests into the ring. That's the orange, really periodic. So we have a periodic read activity. Uh, with disk ops and, uh, well, IOPS and then disk bytes read out of disk. So you can see those, you know, always correlate with the read requests, but then at the right end of the graph, there's something much bigger that happened there. So it's probably a good idea that we have some other driver of traffic there we want to look into. And those are the kind of things that's very, very simple to pull up with correlations. <coughs> uh, dashboards. So this is. A bigger part of visualization, a lot of tools have correlation, but one of the things I think a lot fall down on that's, that's hyper important are dashboards, right? And the reason for that, 
if you have dashboards, these are actually a way, much like you can think of as a wiki, to have a shared understanding across all levels of your team, right? And there's a lot of times where someone asks you to go do something, go do this. You know, the CEO said we need to do this. Well, why do we need to do that? You don't know, you go do it. <clears throat> if you have your business drivers uh, or your app performance or whatever up on a wall on a plasma where everybody can see when they're walking by to get their, their coffee, then everybody's on the same page. And not only that, everybody's on the same page up to the minute. And as they're doing that, also, there's no more sophisticated aberration detection than your marketing guy who knows nothing about your technology looking at a dashboard, right? And one of the most interesting things is that that's literally happened to me where I'll be hacking away and, and, and our marketing guy will go, Joe, what, why is that? What is that? And I'll look up and, oh, crap. You know, we have to go do something. And so what's really cool about having these all, you know, if you have these up, is, is people will see things. And finally, if, if your marketing guy isn't up at you know, 1 a.m. looking at a dashboard when something goes wrong and your alert catches it, uh, dashboards, if you have a dashboard for everything, this actually provides a firefighting manual, right? If your expert says, OK, I'm going to build a dashboard for this thing. These are the most important things for this. When something's wrong, you go look here first. You're going to open that up when something's going wrong. Oh, open the dashboard for that. And you'll see, oh, OK, this one, this one looks really funny. So I'm not a, a total expert here, but this is where I'm going to go first. Um, so when you're looking at systems, I mean, we focused a lot on this. But I think you want something that's going to make it very easy to template dashboards and make a lot of them and make them easy to pull up. Uh, this is an example, like one of ours. So this is for our API. So we track. This is one of the ones we have up. Uh, you know, our, our average response time, the response times for every post operation, response times for get operations, the number of errors and success codes we're returning per, broken out by host in the stack graph below. Um, and so when any of these shift, you know, we're dealing with, you know, thousands upon thousands of requests per second, things can get messy in a hurry. Uh, dashboards could be a whole other talk. So this is a great book. Uh, it talks a lot about visualization techniques in general. It's a very easy read, but also how to design dashboards and, and what to look for. So the last bit I'm going to talk about uh, is alerting. Oh, sorry, you had a question? Right. Right. Yeah, so the, I think the question, just in summary, is if, if you're using something like a platform as a service where you don't have as much transparency into things, like if there's a load balancer issue on their part, how do you build a common dashboard that says, oh, it's, it's not my service, it's theirs? Um, so that's, that's actually one of the hard platform as a service problems. Um, and I think you know, that space is, is maturing still. I think that's one of the things they're going to get to. But you know, they actually need to give you access. Right now, um, using Heroku as an example, right, they, they do provide Heroku logs. Um, so one of the things that won't help you in the case that their load balancer is dropping packets. Um, so using an external service like a, you know, a Pingdom or a new relic that's going to give you insight. Um, so use, that's, a, that's a one good thing, though. Uh, Using specialized services is not necessarily bad. I mean, everyone should obviously still use Google Analytics. Um, you know, if you have a lot of new Relic expertise and you're using that, you should keep using that. Um, I would look for services that give you the ability to pull out the cream of the crop of what they're, they're generating for you and get that into a common place you can correlate it against other things. So one thing I would look for is it, with your Pingdom, perhaps, is an API that you can pull stats out and get that into a uh, common storage thing. So every minute you query Pingdom, get the latest thing, and put that into the common canonical repository uh, that's going to give graph your dashboard. Uh, we, we talk more after if you want to. Um, so alerts, the, the big thing with alerts is that you have to think of them as being alive, right? So 
If you set an alert up, uh, something like disk capacity is pretty easy to set a threshold and say, okay, when this thing gets 90% full and it's not magically going to get bigger, let me know, walk away, and never touch it again. But alerts for a lot of other things, as your service evolves, your thresholds are going to change. Uh, so you want to be thinking about ways that you can tune these, right? Because there's nothing worse than a noisy alert. Because first, it annoys me, and second, I don't care about it. You can, uh, if my inbox is piling up with stuff, I just, uh, that, that thing's always going. And something could actually be on fire. <clears throat> so with alerts, uh, there's different nomenclature for this, the way at least I, I think about it. So you want clear your threshold. This is what actually triggers it. That's simple enough. But look for things like having a, a, a cancel threshold. And uh, part of this right now, this is monkey see, monkey do. I'm still building this in my, what I'm building. But you're going to want something like a cancel threshold where you say, okay, when, it, when it, it goes over this, throw me an alert, but do not come to me again unless it goes down below this lower amount and then comes back up. <clears throat> you probably want a rearm window, too, that says, okay, we're going to have a cancel threshold, but if it does that within five minutes, don't bother me again. You'll probably want some ability to throw a function on that. Say, I'm really looking for the exponential weighted moving average or the min or the max. And you probably want to do that over several samples. So look for windowing capabilities, too, when you're alerting. And another thing for alerting is, I think, really look for integrations, especially in, in, in you know, now, is with third-party services, right? <clears throat> so, I mean, we do alerts. We just work on your stream. But then I think you want something that's going to say, hey, you can hook this in with your email. You can hook this in with your campfire. You can hook this in with your pager duty and not say, oh, you, you better like our escalation strategy. You know, like myself as monitoring, I don't, I'm, we're not, I don't know the first thing about escalation. So if you want escalation, go use PagerDuty. So whatever tools you have, look for integrations. Um, and the last cool thing, if I could leave, this next thing could be the subject of a whole talk. But this is still, even with living alerts and paying attention, uh, there are some very hard scenarios to deal with, right? I mean, it's all aberrant behavior. Um, so if your load is evolving over, over time, right, and you have maybe some seasonal shifts, like Saturday nights my load is way less than Monday morning, how do you deal with that? Uh, and there's some interesting work being, I guess, done uh, or has been done. Uh, I know we're looking into, probably other people. Uh, how do you automatically detect that? Um, and so one thing you look for is uh, Holt Winters, which is a 50-year-old algorithm from the field of time series modeling. But the idea is that uh, because this is all time series data, once I've, once I've got past the collection point, this is all generic time series data, right? There are very advanced mathematical models. I mean, guys on Wall Street make money based off time series data, so there is very advanced mathematical models for prediction. So if I apply one of these models to, say, my CPU, CPU load average coming in, I can predict, you know, you could predict what the next value should be. If the next value shows up and it's some number of deviations away from that, it's something you should start looking at, right? Or maybe three in a row. Um, this particular one is what's called triple exponential smoothing. And what's interesting about it is it takes three things into account. It takes the stationary trend into account. It takes a linear trend, so if traffic's growing from 8 in the morning to noon. And it takes a seasonal effect into account, which is, you know, like an e-commerce site, December is way crazier than June, probably. All right. So in conclusion, uh, a couple takeaways. When you're looking at tools or building tools or putting things together, try to achieve those separations of concern. <clears throat> monitoring equals tests. For your ops guys, monitoring is your unit tests. And if you're devs, you probably wouldn't want to live without those. So make it easy for your ops or for yourself. Uh, you want the ability to have a, as much as you can a single repository that you use as a canonical store of, of truth. You can build arbitrary correlations from. Dashboard all the things. Plasmas are cheap. They're like a couple hundred bucks now. So uh, if you're bootstrapped, you're very early stage, I get that. But anything past that, the money you'll save just by having a couple plasmas up and a couple Mac minis, well worth it. <clears throat> and finally, care and feed for your alerts. Have alerts, but constantly tune and update them. Uh, and that's, that's, that's it. So. Thank you.